Welcome to the One Gang Worldwide Podcast, your ultimate ride into the world of motorcycles. Visit CyclesWorldwide.com where we offer a completely free marketplace for everything motorcycles. Join our One Gang community where you can connect, share info, and swap stories with riders from all over the world. Join for free at CyclesWorldwide.com and be a part of the One Gang community right now. On today's episode of the One Gang Worldwide Podcast, we're honored to have Talon Skeels Piggins with us. Talon's life took an unexpected turn after a motorcycle accident left him paralyzed, but his journey didn't stop there. It only shifted gears. Today, Talon will share his incredible story of transformation from tragedy to triumph, competing as a Paralympian, and how he uses his experiences to encourage others to overcome their challenges. So get ready to be inspired as we dive into a conversation about life, challenges, and the pursuit of greatness with Talon Skeels Piggins. Right and then on the one game I continued podcast. to get rolled underneath the car, massive internal injuries. Uh, and then I came out the back of the car and I was still alive. And yeah. And I, in one moment of time, I've gone from this sort of PE teacher living the dream, living in this beautiful city of Bath, having this wonderful girlfriend, to somebody that was just broken. One Gang Worldwide Podcast. Brought to you by Keyboard Motorcycle Shipping. Since 1978, Keyboard Motorcycle Shipping has been that trusted name in transporting motorcycles safely across the country. With custom designed pallets and air ride trailers, your bike is secure and protected every step of the way. By choosing Keyboard Motorcycle Shipping, you're supporting a dedicated small business that prioritizes quality and customer satisfaction. Ship with a peace of mind, knowing your motorcycle is in expert hands. Visit KeyboardMotorcycleShipping.com for more information. Now, let's dive into today's episode. All right, guys. Welcome to the One Gang Worldwide Podcast. we got an awesome one today. Uh, Talon Skeels Biggin. Uh, he is an executive coach, children's author, athlete mentor, double world champion, Paralympian, and a public speaker. This is going to be an excellent show. We've been looking forward to this. So thank you so much for joining us, very, Colin, and welcome to the show. Thank, thank you very much. We're excited to be here. Thanks for being with us. So the way that we start most most episodes, we, uh, we won't change off too much, but we're curious. Tell us about how you grew up, where you grew up, how you grew up, and how your, your interest in motorcycles originally started. So I, I grew up in Cornwall uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and my main passion when I was younger was water sport. Cornwall is surrounded on three sides by water. So it was just a natural progression for me to get involved in anything to do with the water. You know, I learned to swim in the sea. So uh, we, that's how close we lived to the, to the, to the ocean. Uh, and after school, when I was at primary school, uh, my mum was a primary school teacher. Uh, she would drive us down to the beach in the summer. And then my brother and I, that was it. That was our playground. And she would sit and she would mark her books. We sat on the beach. And my brother and I would be uh, splashing about the waves, learning to swim, learning to climb rocks, learning how to fall off rocks uh, uh, and all the adventurous stuff that you do when you're a small child uh, and your your mum's not quite keeping such a, an eye on you and you can escape. Uh, I suppose I got into, I got into windsurfing and surfing, and that was really exciting for me. Uh, and then I sort of, we had bikes obviously, and that was really enjoyable. Uh, and then there was always this other aspect of, of motorcycling. And we had cousins that lived on a farm and they had dirt bikes. And when we were allowed to ride on them, it was an incredible thrill and I always used to look forward to going to see them, to go and see Jeremy and Keith and have a go on their motorbike. But unfortunately, we'd had a number of relatives within the family, elder relatives that had passed away due to motorcycle accidents. So oh, wow. it was, it was a big forbidden thing to ever ride a motorcycle on the road. And so it was there, it was something that we, we weren't allowed to touch, but it was exciting but we weren't really allowed to go there. And it was, it was like that forbidden fruit. Yeah. Wow. So you did come from a motorcycle family per se, right? I mean, basically you had members of your family riding bikes at that time. So you were kind of around it at yeah. an early age. 
Yeah. Well, my, my great uncle Chippy, he was the first motorcycle policeman in, in the area. Uh, wow. He was a, uh, yeah, he was, he was like chips, I guess. <laughs> Did anything happen to him on the bike or was he okay? But it was raining in always a raining pool. Um, sorry. Did anything happen to him or was he okay on the bike? Uh, he was okay, but, um, we had another relative. So the, my mum's side is from Cornwall. Um, we go back to, I think the 12th century and the family was involved in, in, in granite quarry. And one of the relatives was following the granite lorry and one of the big oh. slabs of granite slid off the back and crushed him. Oh, uh, so that oh. was, that was one. And another time, you know, years ago roads, well, roads aren't safe now, but obviously a year ago, tires weren't that great. And there's a lot of rain in Cornwall and, uh, another relative lost control in the wet and crashed and was, was tragically killed. So. It, it, it was, it was something that we were just basically forbidden for, for doing. And, uh, you know, I, when, as soon as I could, I learned to drive a car, uh, because living in Cornwall, you're very, uh, isolated. You live in little villages. And so to get anywhere, you really needed to have your car. And for me, windsurfing and surfing, I, I desperately needed something uh, that I could like that I could use to get myself about, but also I needed to transport my surfboard. I need to transport my windsurfer or my sailing kit. Yeah. So, you know, it was, was more, uh, it, it, it was better for me, uh, to, to pursue my sports, sure. right. but I suppose it was always there. It was always there, uh, in the background, something that I wanted to do, but I really wasn't allowed to do. And then when I left Cornwall went off, did a few bits and pieces. Then I ended up in the Navy. So I was in the, in the Royal Navy and I was based in Portsmouth for a while. And I was living with a friend outside of Portsmouth and to get into Portsmouth is, is it's really bad traffic. And I thought, you know, I really enjoy living away, but I, you know, it's an hour and a half going in because of the traffic. And then somebody next door was selling a little one, two, five. And it was the RGV one, two, it was a Suzuki RGV one, two, five gamma, a bright yellow. And, uh, I thought, well, maybe I'll just get a motorbike and then I can easily get in and out to work. That would be a, a far, far better way for me to get in. And then I, I'm not spending so much time stuck in the car. And yeah, we did a deal and I bought a motorbike and I bought his old helmet and a leather jacket and that was it. And he told me, right. That side's the brake, that side's the clutch. There's the oh, throttle. Perfect. That's where the gears are. Fine. And I oh, mean, oh, I mean, how I, how I didn't crash the first day, I don't know. I mean, obviously nowadays it's safer for people to learn to drive motorbikes because you go through your compulsory basic training in this country. Uh, but in those days, because I had a car license, it automatically meant I had a provisional license for a motorcycle. Oh, wow. no, I, right. I had absolutely no idea how to ride one of these things on the road. <laughs> I, knew, I knew the rules of the road from driving a car, but I didn't know how a motorbike worked. And, you know, I'd be, I'd be stomping through the gears and not using the clutch and slowing down and forgetting to pull the yeah. clutch in and pulling it and off. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I did a yellow bike and it got me in and out, uh, to the, uh, to the ship. Of course, man. Uh, it was freedom and it, and then I, you know, it, it just, it was an incredible thing. It was an incredible thing to be on a motorbike. It was How so old cool were you at this time? So Definitely I was in my, early, yeah, I was in my early twenties and this amazing sense of freedom. And I, I, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty quick bike, the RGV 125. And, uh, I think the guy that had it had managed to tinker with it a little bit, and, you know, you used to get about 70, 80 miles an hour out of this thing. And it'd be wow. screaming little head Whee! six foot two. And I'm quite a big person. So you'd have right, this that's a smaller bike, right? Little tiny, yellow, bright yellow bike. Looping around. That's so funny. I'm as small as possible to go as fast as I could. 
Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, it was, it was. How did your mom and it? dad feel about that? I didn't tell Did you them. tell them? <laughs> I knew it. So this is, this is where things start to go a little bit wrong for me. So mm. I went away to the, uh, I went on deployment. When I came back from deployment, I thought, right, I'm going to get the bike out, make sure it works. And it was a sunny day and I got on it and it worked and I just drove it up maybe three, 400 yards. And I thought, that's it. I'm just going to go around the roundabout and I'm going to go back because, you know, that's all I want to do. I just wanted to make sure it worked. And then I was going to go for a ride the next day or the day after, whatever it was. Uh, and then because it was sunny, I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll just go a little bit further. And then I could see there was a, a ride up to the top of a hill and it would overlook the whole of Portsmouth. And it would be, a, and it's a really beautiful view to look down and see over Portsmouth, over the harbour, over the Solent, up to the Isle of Wight. So it's a, it's a great view. So I just, I just, instead of going around the roundabout and heading back, I just carried on and the road takes you up a slight rise and then it drops. As I got to the crest of the rise and I was heading down the other side, there was a car coming towards me and, and it just didn't see me and it turned straight across in front of me and I T-boned it mm. and I just somersaulted. All I remember seeing is bonnet. Sky, road, sky, oh. road, sky, bam. And then I was, and I was flat on my back and, and everyone sort of, sort of run up and gathered around and I, and I had, I went into spinal shock because of the sort of rapid extension and compression of being flung. I sort of, I got, I went numb from the waist down and it was, it was and the sun was out. So they, they called the ambulance, the ambulance turned up. And then they, they undid my leathers and I, and I had a t-shirt and, and in the middle of the white t-shirt was a big speed sign. And it says to 108 miles an hour, more speed vicar. And so that knew that I was some sort of speed maniac. And then I'd come right, right. over. And, oh, he uh, came uh, around the corner with fire in his eyes sort of thing. You know, uh, uh, I then had a person that was going way too fast and, you know, which I hadn't done, uh, but yeah, then I went to hospital, I had smashed my wrist up and it was there that the hospital rang my mother to tell her that I'd been involved in a motorcycle accident. And that was a bit of a weird conversation because my mother was going, you've got the wrong mother because my son does right. not have a motorcycle. Right. Uh, and then they had to say, well, that's a conversation you're going to have to have with your son because you aren't the Hills Figgins, aren't you? He was like, yes. Okay. Well, he's got some explaining to do, but uh, you know, uh, then, that was my first, yeah, that was my first sort of big crash. Um, and then weirdly that sort of enabled me to buy a bigger motorbike because I got compensation from that accident. That then enabled me to go and do a, uh, an intensive course to learn mm. to ride a motorcycle, uh, which I was able to do in three days. And at the end of that, I then was able to go out and buy myself an old Honda CBR 600 F an, an old bike. belly mold. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that was my first motorbike, my first real oh, motorbike and bike man. I had left because obviously conversation takes a really long time to, to come about and so it'd been three or four years so i had left the navy by that stage and i was now living in london and so i then used the motorcycle as my commuter to get from where i was living into the center of london so i was working in piccadilly so right in the center of london and i was living in a place called acton and then and the bus route was really awkward and the train route was really awkward to get in and out so having a motorbike was far far easier and I can yes. weave my way through the traffic. Uh, and so I learned, I suppose that's when I really started to learn to ride a motorcycle and I learned amongst traffic. So for me riding in amongst traffic, it's, it's absolutely no problem whatsoever. You know, whereas you have people that learn to ride in the countryside or in a, in a less built up area. And they're great on the roads, but then you put them in amongst traffic and they're like, oh my word, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. 
and that you have to have a very different mindset when you're in traffic because mm. you basically assume that every single yeah. person is about to pull out on you and sure. wants to kill you. Um, yeah. And so you, right. sort of when you're filtering, you have to be so aware of somebody has just stopped to let someone else pull out and you get that sort of, you know, the rabbit coming out the hole and, you know, yeah. Right. yeah. Tell us. Um, uh, Sorry, I've been going on for... Uh, no, sorry, I was going to ask you, um, can you take us into the moment of uh, 2003 uh, when when the accident happened and kind of take take the listeners a little bit through that part of the life, what, what had happened and, you know, the things that went on? So we, let's go to 2003. I was a PE teacher. So I'd moved out of London. I'd gone to university, got my degree. I was teaching PE. And I was really, really happy because I found the one job that I was meant to do because I love sport and it makes me happy. And I love teaching. And so being a PE teacher was the perfect job. And I had, I had just arrived back from my girlfriend's house. As I walked in through the door on the Saturday morning, so March the 8th, 2003, I opened the door to the phone ringing picked the phone up and it was a friend oh we're one short can you come and help us out with we, we need we need some we need you to come play rugby and at the time i had retired from rugby because i'd smashed my shoulder i'd really badly damaged it so i was like no i can't i can't you know i I've, i had to stop and and he was like please can you look, look we'll just stick you on the wing we'll stick you out the way we're just really short it's a really important game and i said fine right. you know what i'll, I'll, I'll come and I'll come and help out. I went out, go and pack my kit, realized that my boots were still at school because though I was a PE teacher and I'd used my boots at school. So I then thought, right, I better go and get my boots. I ran outside. It was raining. No, I, I don't know. I ran. Ran outside and looked at the traffic and I thought, oh, I'm never going to get there and back in time. I'll take the bike. So I went back in, got on the bike, got to the school, picked up my boots. As I was walking out of school, I saw one of the caretakers who was randomly in there because something had happened the night before and he was tidying up. And I spoke to him for 30 seconds just to say hi that I was there. Then I got on my motorbike. And 200 yards later, as I was riding along, a car came out of a side road and it didn't see me and it clipped me. And it knocked me off the bike and onto the other side of the road. At the same time, there was another car coming the opposite way and I was thrown straight into the path of the oncoming traffic. The car couldn't take any avoiding action, went straight over the top of me. The, the car hit me in between my shoulder blades and that immediately shattered two bones called T4 and T5. And so that paralyzed me from effectively the armpits down. The left-hand side of me was crushed breaking my rib cage and puncturing my left lung. My head then got wedged underneath the car and I was dragged down the road by my head and that broke two more bones in my neck at C6 and C7. Now, I'm very fortunate that the breaks in my neck didn't damage the spinal cord. It was really close. Apparently it was you know just like a millimeter of movement and I'd have been paralyzed to the neck down. Uh, and I know that life would be very different because having different. upper arm is, is, is massive. Um, and then continued to get rolled underneath the car, massive internal injuries. Uh, and then I came out the back of the car and I was still alive and yeah. And I, in one moment of time, I've gone from this sort of PE teacher living the dream, living in this beautiful city of Bath, having this wonderful girlfriend to somebody that was just broken and Somebody stopped and he came up and he said, you, you all right? And initially I was like, what? Um, you know what? I'm, 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 I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay. Uh, but can you felt like I was bent backwards the wrong way? And I said, can you, can you just pull my legs out? I'm, I'm bent the wrong way. And he said, mate, you're, you're lying flat. And I sort of tried to, I tried to move to get up and I couldn't. And you, you. Unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, and I just knew in that instant of time I was paralyzed. I just yeah. knew it. 
I couldn't move. I had these really unusual sensations and, oh, it was devastating. And I had to lie there, wait for the ambulance. And as the ambulance was arriving or and it took 25 minutes for the ambulance to get to me. And during that time I was bleeding into my right lung. I was filling that up with blood. And so when the ambulance arrived, I only had about half a liter of lung capacity left. Uh, and I lost consciousness and then I was, uh, you know, in and out of consciousness and, and it's all credit to the ambulance crew that they were able to stabilize me and to, to save my life because. Uh, the consultants subsequently have said that that sort of accident, only 1% of people survive. Wow. So I'm, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I'm here. You know, I really, really am. Um, and then I was taken to Salisbury. They have a specialist spinal unit. Uh, I was given maybe a 30% chance of surviving the next four weeks. Uh, really? that, and, and then I was told that, well. I was in that consciousness, didn't really know what's going on, but when I did have enough about me to have a conversation, I was told that I'd been in this traumatic accident. I was paralyzed. I was never going to walk again. And then I'd be in hospital for, for two years because of all of the, the damage that I'd done internally. And yeah, I just gave up. I gave up then and there, you know, I'm not going to try and make out that I was like, Hey, I'm going to take this one on the chin. Right. I couldn't. Right. It was that the change was so immense, I couldn't cope with it. And so I asked them, I, I want to turn off the life support machine to let me die. I couldn't, there was no way that I could cope being in a wheelchair. You know, my life was sport. That was, that was me. That's what I did. Right. I was you know, rolling around. I was doing stuff. Um, what would I ever do in a wheelchair? I couldn't see the opportunities that were out there for me, all I could see was the impact of change. And I, and I believe that people that undergo traumatic change, they often can only see that first initial bam, they, the change happens and that's all they can see the immediate after effects of it. And in fact, we only have to go back a few years, COVID and so many people went into countries, went into lockdown. And there was that change in everyone's life. And you remember the, that people were afraid. They were afraid of change. They're afraid of the unknown. And they couldn't see far enough ahead into the future to the fact that, you know, we're back to normal now. Right. Uh, and so it is very difficult for us as human beings to process immense change in our lives. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, it takes a long time, it takes a very long time to actually accept these changes. And for, I mean, to be honest, it took me 13 years to be all right about being in a wheelchair, 13 years. I mean, even, you know, as I progressed and I got better and I left hospital and I thought, yeah, I've got it sussed. I hadn't not even close to it and, it and it takes us a long time to accept the changes that happen to us in our life uh you have to begin the process you have to take that first step and that first step is allowing yourself to go through the sort of the, the massive fluctuations in emotions you know, the, the highs, the lows, oh my gosh, it, it, it is magnified when you have trauma. Um, you know, I was bouncing up and down and going to some very, very dark places in my mind. But I had to allow myself to go through that because that is part of that acceptance process. And, you know, you go through the various stages of, of denial. And I tried to keep going when I was first injured, I kept trying to go to sleep so that I could wake up and this all be a terrible dream. But obviously every time I woke up, I was still paralyzed. Then you try and do the bit of bargaining, you know, oh, what if I, what if, what if, what if, you know, what if I hadn't picked up the phone that morning? 
What if I'd have taken the car instead of the motorbike? What if I hadn't stopped and chatted to the person at the school for 30 seconds? Right. I wouldn't have been yeah. in that spot to get run over. With what ifs? Sorry? Yeah. How long were you in the hospital? Was it actually that two year expectation? That's a lot of time to be cooped up in the, what feels like a jail. I would imagine to just be rewinding and going through all those what ifs in your head. Yeah. So the, the, the time in hospital, obviously initially given two years, the first phase was what they call conservative management of a spinal fracture. So basically lie still, don't move. And that was 16 and a half weeks. So I was lying still, wow. not moving 16 and a half weeks, which meant that I didn't do anything. I just lay there. I looking at a ceiling. And in those days, 2003, mobile phones weren't really a big thing. We weren't allowed to have mobile phones in the hospital because they said, oh, it's going to mess with the electronics. We weren't, we didn't have computers. It was, it was really, really boring. However, in retrospect, that 16 and a half weeks of basically not doing anything allowed me to begin the process of accepting, to allow myself to feel the discomfort because I wasn't distracted by scrolling on my phone or doing stuff on the internet or whatever. I had right. to sit with the uncomfortable thoughts. And we need to have time to do that in order to process what is going on in our life. If we always distract ourselves, we never process our life events. So that was the first stage. And then the next stage is, uh, the rehabilitation stage. And that took me effectively another 16 weeks. Uh, so I was out of hospital in six and a half months. So six and a half months to get out of hospital from my original accident. The first night that I spent in my new apartment, I, I was thinking, what have I done? What have I done? Yeah. Hospital, everything is, is flat. The, the, you know, it's easy access. The doors are wide. It's all right. built for wheelchairs. I was living in Bath, which is an historic Georgian town in the, in England, and it's got cobbles and it's got pavements that have got uneven slabs on it and everywhere is hilly. And my apartment was this Georgian building and it wasn't designed for a wheelchair and it was really difficult to move about in it. And I just saw multiple floors. So I had, was it multiple floors? Yeah, so I was the I was the ground floor of five floors. It was a very very tall Georgian building. Had massively high ceilings. It was bitterly cold. You know, had these old such windows that used to rattle in it. Oh my word! And I thought I, I've 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 left hospital too early. The reason I did leave hospital at that point was because I suppose mentally I was starting to take quite a bit of a dip. You know, I was. I was doing okay in hospital. I was able to look after myself, push myself about my wheelchair, take care of my body functions, you know, get myself dressed in the morning. And then it was sort of like, I felt like I was marking time. And so the consultant made the decision that, yeah, I could, I could leave. And that he felt I had enough about me to be able to cope with it. And, and he was right. I did cope with it, but initially when you come away from the support network that you have within hospital with all the nurses, all the care assistants there, and then you're suddenly by yourself, the big world is quite scary. Alan, can I ask you a question? Um, yeah. how did you find the strength that you said you, you, you were always at that point and, it, and it's natural because you're, you know, you, you are understanding the situation. Like, do you remember the time, the day when you kind of physically found that strength to kind of say, okay, this is the situation and this is what I'm going to do about it. I, I couldn't tell you the day, 
but it was during my time of life flat on my back at six first 16 and a half weeks probably towards i don't know maybe 10 or 12 weeks in and all of the the scenarios that you are replaying in your mind to try and mentally change what has happened in reality and you realize that no matter what you do you're still in the same situation and that suddenly hit me like a ton of bricks that no matter what I was going to do in my head, nothing was going to change the fact that I was paralyzed. And so then I had this decision of, well, are you going to be one of those bitter and angry people that remains resentful? about a situation that you find yourself in or are you going to go out there and try and live a life and it was a very uncomfortable conversation to have with myself but because I had no and I had to go through it and I think that if I was maybe distracted through the phone or through or the world of the internet which people can do nowadays, I probably wouldn't have had that conversation because I could have just distracted myself right, all the distracted time. Distracted your mind, of course. Distracted my mind. And so, uh, although at the time I didn't want to spend that amount of time in bed, I realized it was very beneficial for me now. Yeah. And, and it, it, and it does make me really understand the importance of allowing ourselves to effectively be bored and then allowing ourselves to have uncomfortable conversations with ourselves because we can find solutions ourselves right. and that's what i suddenly realized i was like hang on i found out the solution myself and then the more i sort of started to look internally the more I, I realized that there was like a whole, a whole support team inside of me and they were all encouraging me to take the next step. And so I found this power, this energy that resided inside. And I, I sort of, I call it the little person inside and it's this, this power, this resilience that I believe lies within each and every person sometimes we just forget it's there you know we don't have the quiet time to look internally and have those difficult conversations with ourselves and then find out hey you know i i, I don't actually have to look externally for inspiration i simply have to look internally because it's only ourselves that really knows what it's like to be ourselves it's only you that knows what it's like to be you no matter what i say ultimately you will make the choices for yourself and you will take responsibility for your own life thank you so and much for i realized it was my responsibility yeah. me it was going to be up to me and i started to change the narrative that I was telling myself that I wasn't going to be a victim, that I was going to be able to take these steps forward. Um, you know, and, and it comes down to even like really silly things like choice of music. So there is a band that's called the sugar babes. And I don't know if you ever heard of them and, but they've got a song and it's called stronger and i used to listen to that song over and over again because in it it's saying i'm getting stronger every day and it is a positive message and it's not so much this you know the song or whatever but it was that that phrase i'm oh, getting yeah. stronger every day and yeah. and that sort of became a mantra it became something that i always told myself that i was going to get stronger every day and even to this point in time, I'm 21 years past my 
accident, right. I will always reflect at the end of each and every day. And I will ask myself the question of what have I done? What have I done today that has either made me a stronger person or made me a better person? That's huge. That's so important. And I have to justify every day, you know, and it might be weird. Like today I've done nothing because I need what I call active rest because our bodies get tired. And if you keep pushing it, you keep pushing it, you get to a point where you just totally collapse. Right. So there are some days where you need to say, do you know what? Today I can't do anything. I just have to allow my body time to recover. And I'm not going to get on a phone and scroll because that is distracting. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to relax and I'm going to reflect upon what has happened over the past day, week, month. And I'm going to allow myself to go through all the really unpleasant conversations that I've been avoiding about myself, about situations, which I found myself in and I behaved in a certain way. And I'm going to check, was that the right way for me to behave or could I have done it a better way? So the next time I come to that situation, I'll know, keep my mouth shut or to say something when I see injustice. So, uh, it became, it, it, it was a, yeah, that, that time in hospital where I couldn't go anywhere, I couldn't do anything. And then I had that really monumental and seismic shift in effectively my outlook in life. Appreciate you sharing that with us. That's uh, incredible, incredible story. That message is something that the entire world needs to hear, especially with the addictive nature of phones and how it's enabling the general populace to ignore themselves and that opportunity to self-reflect. And I'm, I can say collectively, uh, we're unbelievably grateful that you made that shift, that you went from wanting to be pulled off of life support to a seismic shift and you're vessel now truly needs to be heard around the world so it's great it's like the the perfect you know cinderella story the narrative it's it's amazing and and now i'm curious so you go from that seismic shift being just stuck on your back staring at a ceiling to then progressing to the point where you decided that you were going to tackle skiing again and get back on the the slopes can you take us through that amazing journey and, and what that was like both internally and also what the actual steps were to get back onto this now. Okay. Then I was pretty, well, okay. When I was told that you could still ski as, as a paraplegic, it just blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. And sure. I just got so excited about it because up to that point, all the things that I thought I might be able to do didn't seem that exciting, but skiing, I knew when I was younger, how much I love skiing. And so going skiing, I thought, oh my God, that's going to, that, that can, that can return happiness into my life. And it yeah. became my focus. It became my, my mental anchor. It became the thing that I could hold on to. It became hope and I, and I, and it, Without it, not entirely sure how things would have panned out. And, and not to interrupt you, but who told you that you could go skiing? Who, who was that voice? So it was a guy that came into the hospital for a regular checkup. So every 18 months to two years, as paraplegics, we go back to a spinal unit and we have a MOT, just like a car. And hmm. we get out, uh, and whilst he was there. The nurses said, could you go and have a chat with Talon? He's, he's really struggling. And he told me that being in a chair was going to be tough. It was going to be difficult, but there were opportunities. So he listed all the different things that he was doing. You know, oh, I've been so here cool. today. I've got a girlfriend and I do this, that, and the other. Yeah. And oh yeah. Well, I've just come back from skiing. And when he said that, I was like, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> Thank God for that and nurse. He, That's amazing. Yeah. So he told me about fiberglass seats on a metal frame 
uh, with these little miniature crutches in your hands that you can use to go down the mountain. And then that, that changed everything for me as well. And so that became my, my new goal. So instead of my previous goal was to become a head teacher, where that's now gone. Now I'm focusing on learning to ski, getting yeah. to the British team and going to the Paralympics. Um, and then I, I found that there is a charity called Backup and they take people who've had spinal cord injuries off to go and do interesting activities. And one of them was skiing. And I got on to the skiing trip and that was 11 months after my accident. And wow. normally you're meant to wait apparently at least 12 months before you go and do anything because of the, the, the damage that you've sustained. I ignored that. I'm off. I'm going skiing. And, uh, the first day. I was assessed and because I had no stomach muscles, they put me in something called a bi ski. So bi ski has two skis underneath it. It's low to the ground. It's quite stable. And by the end of the morning, I was absolutely flying around the mountain. And I was thinking about the greatest red. I'm a major yeah. ski racer. Uh, and then I found out that you can't race a bi ski. You can only race a mono ski. So I then asked to have to go in a mono ski. But everyone said, well, no, you can't because you're a high level injury. You lot, you just cruise around the mountain in the bi ski. That's what you do. And you leave the racing up to people with stomach muscles. And so we had a bit of a disagreement. And then I finally ended up in a mono ski. And in my head, I was just going to be amazing. And in the afternoon, I tried to ski this thing and I, it, was, it was a total disaster. I couldn't go more than three or five yards without falling over. I was utterly, utterly rubbish. And I just kept falling and failing and I was effectively wasting their time. And it took me about six days before I could go any further than five or 10 yards without falling over. And it was when I changed my thought process. Because sometimes when we're trying to do something, we already take ourselves to the end result, to that end state. So in my head, I'm already world champion ski racer. That's what I'm going to do. That, that's me. Correct. I wasn't. I, I hadn't even allowed myself to be a beginner. I hadn't allowed myself to be present in the moment. And in the moment, I was a total beginner. And so on the sixth day, just realized that what am I doing trying to be a racer? I haven't even been a beginner. So I cleared my mind, any sort of preconception of what I could be to allow myself to be in the moment and just allow myself to be a total novice. And I suddenly had my little breakthrough and it was incredible. And I went, I don't know, maybe four or 500 yards without falling over and I came to a stop. It's just over the moon. It's me in the moment. Think about the process, not the end result, because the end result will come. But you've got to live in the now, not in the present or living in the past. You know, and I was also a bit living in the past because I used to ski and I could stand up when I, when I was able-bodied. And I was, I was pretty good skier. And so in my head, I was still, well, I'm really awesome at skiing. Yeah. And I'm sure. going to be cut skiing uh but no so yeah that was a, a, a you, that was a really important moment for me to realize to be in the moment and be present and then i went and joined the british team and watched them and skied with them and we realized that i needed to individualize the sit ski for me because sit skis the mono skis uh, which are designed for racing and are effectively designed for people that have stomach muscles. So I, I don't have stomach muscles. I had to think of other things to do to uh, overcome the design for, to account for the fact that I didn't have stomach muscles. So I needed shoulder straps. So we took a luggage strap off, we put it over my shoulders, attached it to the back of the seat, over my shoulders and around my waist belt. So by right. shrugging, my shoulders, I could put tension in the straps, which went on oh, cool. Control my, right? So I could yeah. get left and right. Too. And 
oh, got me a development team of the British disabled ski team. And that was 14 months after my original accident. Wow. So, you know, so much for the consultant saying that I'd be in hospital for two years That's right. because 14 uh -huh. months. Wow. I'm in the development squad. And so, so, so competing in amazing. Well, so I think it's amazing what we can do, how far we can go Correct. as human beings. If we have the mental positivity, if we have that mental anchor to hold on to, and, and we trust and believe in that energy inside of us, Correct. you know, and, and so many other people that, you know, have had traumatic illness, they change their mindset. And then doctors are baffled as to why are they still alive? You know, it's all to do with this. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Um, like competing in a Paralympic uh, games, obviously it's a dream for a lot of athletes. Uh, what was the experience like representing Great Britain? I mean, your, your country and in the Alpine skiing and the uh, winter Paralympics in uh, 2010 in Vancouver, what was, what was that like? Uh, because that is, you know, we, we watch it on TV and obviously you, you, you watch the Olympics and the athletes and everything they go through, but you actually did it, man. Can you, can you take uh, us and the listeners kind of through Vancouver, what we, all that was about and, and what you did? Yeah. But for me, getting to Vancouver was, was an incredible achievement because I hadn't qualified until the very last race so i had i had all the pressures on me to qualify for this for this last race and it was in it was in december and i and i had to perform if i didn't perform in that one particular race i wasn't going so simply to get there was an overwhelming sense of relief and then i was i felt both honored and humbled to be there as well you know i felt very very proud of what I had done to get there. Mm -hmm. And, and it, I felt, I felt sort of a, a weight, uh, of expectation upon me and, you know, I, and, and I felt very proud to be there representing my country. Right. And those feelings can also support you. But then they can also really damage you when you perform because in the, in the, in the games, you know, then it's a sound. So I ski with my shoulders. Yeah. So I hit my entire body left and right. If I had summit muscles, I would sit bolt up right. And then I would be able to move the ski underneath me and I would push the ski down. But because I tip, I push the ski off the snow and it was the super G race, which was the race that I wanted to win, it was very, very icy. And so I was skidding all the way down the mountain because I, I struggle with the icy conditions. And I went across the finish line and I thought in my head that I performed well and that I won the gold medal. And I looked at the leaderboard and then I saw my name down in 25th place. And so close. <laughs> oh my God, I was, I was really devastated. Was devast I was totally devastated. I, I felt, I felt humiliated. I felt that I had let down myself, my family, my friends, my country, wow. Wow. that, uh, and that I was, I, I was, I was worthless because of, you know, you, you carry a feeling of pride. You fat, you carry the the expectations of your country, of your friends, of your family, and then to not deliver it, it's, it's brutal. It is brutal on you. And I went back to the athletes village and I was in tears, absolute tears. And it was only because the coach and I went through the race and I talked about the fact that I'd given the best start that I'd ever done, that I was in the right place all the way down the mountain that I had you know, gone as fast as I actually could. I could not have gone any faster. I gave my best. And that was the most important thing to the coach that when it mattered, I had given my best. And so she said that she was really proud of what I achieved. 
because I had given my best. And, you know, the more I start to think about it, the more I realize that, you know what, I can only control what I do. And what I did was the best that I could have possibly done. And so now I'm very proud of my 25th because I knew I couldn't have gone any faster. And, you know, that was a great code. That was well, 2010. Weirdly, the very next race, the very next Super G race I took part in was the opening race of the next season. Right. And all the same people are there. So the Paralympic champions there and, you know, world champion and everything. But this time conditions are soft. And I like something Something different. different. Yeah. And I gave myself a great start and I was in the right place all the way down the mountain. And I knew when I went across the finish line that I couldn't have gone any faster. And so I didn't even look at the leaderboard because I went, you know what? I'm happy where awesome. that puts me. That's I gave amazing. my best. Well, look yeah. what, 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 what type Amen. of were you reaching? Uh, probably about mm. probably about 60 miles an hour. Wow. But in that particular case, turns out I beat everybody by about two seconds. So I went on to become a European champion. Yeah. Yes. One race. Three miles thing. an hour of blue. We, Another race, you give everything we get a gold medal. So, you know, so long as we give our best and you focus on that, you can always be proud of everything that you do because that's yeah. the most important thing. We give our best. Uh, and you know, it's, it's a really important lesson for especially kids to learn that, mm. you know, there's only ever going to be one person that wins a gold medal in a race. But that doesn't detract from the amount of effort that you've put in to train for it and to compete at it. And that if you know you've given your best, you, you should be proud of whatever result you end up with. And that's the most important thing that we give our best. I mean, yeah. Everyone needs to hear that kids and adults. That's, we ask our son after his baseball games, if he, if he won his gold, if he put his best out and had He's 10 and it's resulted in an incredible attitude for sport. It has such power behind it. Uh, so yeah. talent ski dream, um, going through your, your comeback journey and documenting the entire thing. What was the most challenging part of documenting everything and, and what impact do you hope that that, that has on, on viewers? The, I suppose, let me think the hardest thing was to take in the first step. I think in any journey, first steps are hardest. Then the second bit is, is giving it one more go. When you get to the point where you, you know, you, you, you're trying to achieve something and you come across this imaginary brick wall, which is in your way and it's stopping you from moving forwards and you're hitting the brick wall and you're trying and you're trying and you, nothing's happening. Nothing's changing. You get to the point where you say, ah, oh, that's it. I give up and you walk away from the brick wall. But if you go back and if you try and give it one more go, hit that wall one more time, be amazed how many times that wall falls down and opens up the pathway to you. Because I know that there were a number of times where if I hadn't given it another go, I wouldn't have succeeded. And I, I would never have made it as a, as a ski racer. Let's go, you know, all the way back to the very first time I went skiing. And the first five days of me just falling and falling and falling and not making any progress. If on that sixth day, and there were some people that told me to go back in the bike ski, if I hadn't given it one more go, I wouldn't have had my breakthrough. Then let's go, you know, into the training and competing. I had a, I had a bad crash. I was helicoptered off the mountain and. And I nearly gave up skiing. Uh, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it one more go. And I went back out and I found the enjoyment again in skiing. And then I had to rebuild it because when you suffer setbacks in, in within a, a sporting world, for example, there are two things you have to concentrate on. One is the physical side and one is the mental side, you know, and I crashed and I hurt myself in this downhill race and it took a couple of months for the physical injuries to, to go away, but mentally I nearly stopped skiing, but I went back and I found enjoyment in it. 
And then I started off doing the slow speed stuff and doing the drills. And I gradually rebuilt my confidence to the point where I could do another downhill. But that took me nearly a year. Wow. And it's sort of remembering that our, when our confidence gets, you know, gets a few hits, when it gets taken down a level, we also have to take a step back. We have to go and find the enjoyment again in certain things and then rebuild ourselves. And it can take a long time to rebuild our confidence. And so it's, it's there's always those aspects that we have to be careful of and that we have to take time to look after. And then I suppose the hardest, the hardest thing I had to deal with was at the end of the, of one season, I'd, I'd risen to number five in the world. That's not bad, really. Not at all. That's pretty good. Then at the start of the following season, my brother committed suicide and that Sorry, man. nearly destroyed me nearly I, I, I still struggle with it and it's, he took his own life and he was struggling with mental health issues and he kept them to himself and he, he didn't like my mom, my dad, yeah. myself, we did, we didn't know anything about it. He was living in Australia, uh, and he, he didn't, he didn't say anything to us. Okay. And then I got a phone call, uh, and, and, you know, I, I had to go and have professional help. You know, there are some things that you just cannot deal with yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and we came and we talked about it and I tried to, again, it's reframing it and looking at it and it was realizing that it was his choice. No matter what, it was his choice. And I had to try and accept his choice in his life. And it was a difficult thing to do, but eventually I sort of managed it. But that whole season, I was rubbish. I, in fact, I was, I stopped, I stopped in a race because mid race, my brother's pumped, pumped into my head. I started crying. I couldn't see where I was going, but I just had to stop. I couldn't even finish a race. And you know, and this is why earlier I said that I, I had just one chance to, to qualify because the year that everybody else on the team was qualifying, I was falling apart and weirdly found motorcycling again. And that's what saved me. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Talon, I wanted to ask you, uh, can you get into a little bit about, uh, Talon's trust and, um, you know, your foundation that you started and maybe tell us the viewers and the listeners a little bit more about the mission of the foundation and some rewarding moments you experienced through your initiatives. Well, the, the T4 trust was really set up to try and help me to do normal things because when you're in a wheelchair, or when you're paralyzed, anything that you would like to do. It's a, there's a whole new world of adapting things in order to do it. So I grew up in Cornwall. I love surfing. So I want to go back to surfing. So we helped to develop a frame for me to lie on. So because I'm a high level injury, when I lie on a surfboard, I lie face down on it and I can't, ah, my back to lift my head up to paddle. So we built a frame that lifted my chest off the board. Uh, it supported me at the side. So it stopped me falling off the board and it enabled me to go surfing again. So, and then we donated that to a surf life school. And hopefully, hopefully they've been using it to teach other people who are paralyzed or who have severe balance issues. Uh, how to be able to, to go surfing again. 
Uh, we also looked at other different sports and we started uh, working with a company called Mobius. This is obviously, I don't know, early 2000s uh, about kiteboarding and using a three-wheeled buggy and a kite to go up and down a sandy beach uh, and figuring out all of the, the different ways that that, can, that could work. Um, and then looking at traveling. And so I went to, at one time I went to the, the edge of the Victoria Falls. So the trust had helped me to go there, but I showed how it was possible to, to get from the edge of the Zambezi river, because when I first arrived, the guy said, oh, well, no, we, we can't take you across because you're paralyzed. We don't take anyone in a wheelchair across, but we found a way of them helping me go down the steep bank into a little dugout canoe, we paddled across the river to a little island. They got the wheelchair out. I sat in the wheelchair. They dragged me backwards through the sand. I had to get lifted over a couple of trees that had fallen down during the wet season and then, you know, get back in my wheelchair and then I got bounced over loads of rocks, but I got to the edge of the Victoria Falls. And they thought that was the first time that someone who was paralyzed had ever got to the edge. So it changed two things. One, it, it was great for me because I finally got there. And the other thing is that the guides knew the next time someone came along in a wheelchair, that they were going to be able to get them to the edge. It's going to, it was yeah. difficult. Well, it's not going to be easy, but if you want to do it, we can make it happen. And so that's what a lot of the, the trust has done is it has enabled me to go and do different activities to show this is how it might be possible for someone who is a high level injury and therefore enable others to realize that they too can go and do it. Hey guys, the show will be back in one minute, right after a word from our sponsor. Hey one gang, tired of feeling like your butt's taking more of a beating than your bike on those long rides? Introducing Butt Buffer, the ultimate solution to saddle soreness. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. These cushions are made from medical grade viscoelastic polymer, scientifically crafted to eliminate pressure points and keep your circulation flowing. No more numb nuts or numb butts. And here's the best part, butt buffer cushions are made right here in the US for the last 30 years. From Harleys to Hondas, we've got a cushion to fit your ride perfectly. Plus with styles ranging from sleek pebble polymer to luxurious sheepskin, there's a butt buffer for every rider's style. Get your butt buffer today at buttbuffer.com. That's buttbuffer.com. Your butt will thank you and you'll ride longer and happier. We've got your butt covered. So before I get into this next question, I, I wanted to just make an interesting observation, um, talking about controlling what you can control and others are going to make their own decision regardless of, of what information you provide them. Um, your, to speak to you and your character, it's interesting to listen because that, that seismic shift that you went through in the hospital going from take me off life support to, I want to go skiing, you know, that, that incredible shift that you went through, um, you not only have that as kind of a, a diving board for all of these opportunities that have come your way throughout this, the rest of your life. I mean, these things that you've overcome, it feels like you rooted this ability in that time in the hospital and finding that little person inside. I just keep going back to that when I'm hearing about your skiing adventures and your ability to overcome hardships and going through what you went through with your brother. So now you're not only able to connect to that little person, but you're also as a motivating factor, you're honoring your brother as well. Um, so with that as kind of a preface going into one of the craziest things about you, um, you, in 2012, the being the first paraplegic to be awarded the ACU road race license for solo, um, going from that to racing able-bodied racers and, and competing in the disabled world championship. Um, it's just, it's mind blowing. It's so incredibly inspiring. And, and I'd love to hear a little bit about that, that journey, um, internally and, and what transpired as in that part of your life, getting, getting into that and going through it. Well, as, as a biker, you generally, the first thing that happens when you have a crash is you go, how's my bike? Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, can I get back on it? And 
I went through the same initial thoughts when I was first run over, but then those thoughts got very rapidly put to one side when the enormity of what happened to me became apparent. But then there was always this little thing in the back of your mind of like, oh, I wonder if I could ride again. But you, I dismissed it because it was just too difficult. I, I just, it wasn't going to happen. And then one winter, I was on a snowmobile. And it's a bit like sitting on a motorbike. And, sure. and I was kept on the snowmobile and this thing was shaking and wobbling underneath me. And I was still staying on it. And I thought, Do you know what? When I ride a motorbike, it was, it was far easier than this. It's not trying to shift little grooves, you know, the, the front skids or whatever they call them. They, they drop into a track and they shift. And, and I was thinking, this is really hard, this. Riding a motorbike's a lot easier. I, I, wonder if I, could, I wonder if I could ride a motorbike again. <laughs> so then I, I, I started to to dwell on that idea and I started to think about it and I wondered how I could possibly do it. And I went onto the internet and I, and I looked up and I researched, and I found that there had been a couple of people that had actually ridden a motorbike having been paralyzed and I saw what they did. And so I went out and I thought, that's it. I'm going to go and buy a motorbike. I'm not going to tell anyone because I don't know if it's going to work. So what I don't want to do is build everybody up, get everyone right. excited, try it, fail. In the and way. Yeah. So it was, it was just a total secret. I went into the, the showroom and this is in 2008. And that time I was looking at motorbikes and I was thinking, well, I had a 600, you know, maybe that's what I'll get. And then my eyes fell upon a GSXR 1000 A6. Probably. And I think that's the one to me. Let, 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 if I'm back on a bike, let's get back in style. Um, and so, yeah, so I bought the most impractical motorcycle possible. Um, got it adapted, took it to an airfield. I had my godson, his mum, and his sister. And it was just the four of us. We went down the corner of this disused airfield and I just tried to ride. And, uh, and it worked. And for five minutes, I was riding a motorbike again uh, and then I fell off. Um, but in those five minutes, I realized it was possible. Oh. I just had to figure out the starting and the stopping. So I had the little landing legs that were on an actuator, but I found it really difficult when you were riding along with the sort of the back legs down with little skateboard wheels on it. It changes your steering from bike to trike. So if you want to right. go left, you turn left. Whereas once you get up to speed with the motorbike, you do counter steering. If you want to turn left, you actually weirdly turn right. You know, you do it intuitively. So I found that very difficult, the starting and the stopping and not knowing if the legs were up or down or what. So eventually right. I've been, uh, I went to a racetrack called Castle Coo. I spoke to the instructors. And we figured out a system of having two people holding the motorcycle. So I, I would get on it whilst it was on a paddock stand. And then I would be launched and caught by two people. So once I'm moving, I have to keep moving. And right. I would go out during the lunch break of the track day. So the track day is going on. Everyone's having their groups. And then lunchtime, everybody stops. And then I went out with two instructors, one in front, one behind, and I would be out there for, I don't know, 20 minutes. And I did that for about a year. So fun. And, and it was incredible. It was, it was exhilarating. It was freedom. I felt just as I had done before. And whereas with the skiing, you look very, very different. When I saw photographs of myself going around Castle Coo racetrack, I, I looked like anyone else. No one could tell that I was paralyzed from the chest out. And that made me feel good inside because I didn't look any no. different. People were sort of staring at you. When you go skiing, often people are like just staring at you. What, what's this? Because you're in this weird looking sitting ski. Traction. Whereas with the motorbike, no one stares at you. 
Um, and then I started to think that there had to be more people that would like to do it. So initially I set up a charity called the bike experience and I bought another bike and I adapted it. And then the deal was that you would come to Castle Coon where, where I was, and I would show you the bike. You would have to bring all your own leathers and all your own equipment and bring your helpers. And I would show you how to get on the bike. I would then use your launchers to launch me. So they got to know how to do it. And then I would simply right. stick you on the bike and launch you up and down in the car park. And then at lunchtime, we would go out on the racetrack. And so that was the very beginning of the bike experience. Uh, okay. and obviously subsequently it's grown into a completely different thing now. Um, but when we go back to the, my journey, so that's going on, uh, and I'm getting a huge amount of satisfaction seeing other people have that freedom again and it becomes a list for other people to go off and do other things. Not every single, of, you know, not all of them carried on on a motorbike. You know, some of them went off and did other things, other different sports. Or the catalyst. Or yeah. Paddling. It became that little catalyst to show they have done what they perceive to be impossible. And if they've done the impossible, well, everything else is, is achievable. And during that time, I was starting to do real track days. So I was starting to get in amongst other riders and I was starting to progress and get quicker. And I started off in the slow group and then I've moved up into the inters and then suddenly I was at, then I gradually found myself in the fast group. Uh, and I went and I did, uh, every race. So every track day I did, I would try and have instruction because I wanted to improve. Mm -hmm. And then what instructor said, you know what, you're faster than most of the races I compete against. And then I thought, whoa, well, maybe I can become a racer. Yeah. And then I started to make inquiries about racing and the governing body, the ACU initially said, no, no, it's not going to happen. Um, and so I went off and I why. did more, well, because they didn't have paralyzed motorcycle races. That was it. We haven't had any paralyzed motorcycle races, so we are never going to have any paralyzed motorcycle races. Right. I went off, I got the California Superbike school. So I did levels one, two, three, four. Uh, and I got a report written by Andy Ibbert, who was the head of the California, California Superbike school here in the UK about my capability of riding. Uh, went back to the ACU and tried to say, look, I've now got a proper race bike. I've got this mini twin. I've done all this training, uh, you know, my hero example lap times of what I'm doing versus various club riders. And so I'm not, I'm not super slow. I'm not going to be, you know, causing a problem because I think they thought I was disabled. I was going to be very, very slow. I was going to be like a mobile chicane. Uh, if there was any red flags, then what would happen if I had a, if I fell off the bike, what would happen? And, you know, they started to change their mind because I was putting forward all of these things that I could do and the training that I had done, and I went and I had a special, uh, into, I, I had to go I mean, it was miles away up country for a very special assessment. And the senior instructor that assessed me for the NACU, he was really happy. He said that I was quicker than a lot of the races that he'd instructed Aye. and, and the ACU were there. And you know, I have a hand shaken by them and said, you're in business, so you can go racing. Yeah. And I, and I was really excited. And then two weeks before my first race, they sent me a letter saying, we're not giving you a license. Oh, come on. Somebody, somebody had, oh. had decided to want it. Um, it wasn't going to happen. So they gave me a license to do hill climbs and sprints. So that's going one at a time. You know, we not quite Pike's Peak, you know, but <laughs> we have hill climbs and sprints in this country. And, and so that's what I started to do the following year. I was doing in 2011, I did, uh, hill climbs and sprints. And every time I went, I got a report written, uh, to make sure that the club that I was with didn't feel that I was causing a delay in the proceedings of the race that I just fitted in with everybody else. I can... With all those written reports, I then, 
I was able to contact um, a chap uh, called Dave, and Dave was running Club Thundersport, and he and I got together and we wrote a proposal to the ACU and he said that he was happy for me to go race with his club and that he would take responsibility for me. And finally, the ACU allowed me to have my license, but there was caveats. I was only allowed 72 and a half horsepower. I could only race at circuits where there was minimal grappled traps. I had to have the permission of all the racers before I could race. And if anybody, either a racer or a marshal, objected, I wasn't allowed to race. Did anybody? Was that mad? No. Many. No, I went to the front race and, and that was an eye opener because I'd done track days. So I, I was like, yeah, I know about race circuits. But when I went to the first race meeting, it was a completely different ball game. You know, there were motorhomes there, <laughs> proper set. Right. It wasn't just a couple of mates at the back of a Ford Transit van, you know, with a little generator. It, it was a totally different animal. The racing, oh my gosh, and it was so intense. Awesome. And at the yeah. time, you know, I, I was very, very new to it. I, I, I slept in my van next to my motorbike, mm. which was the back of my van. Uh, I used to borrow tire warmers i had to borrow a, a front paddock stand oh i was i was just <laughs> i was a total baby i was completely out of my depth as far as what it needed to be a racer right sure. um but they made me start from the pit lane so came to my first race i was in the pit lane everybody went and uh the, the, the marshal waved his flag, Sid, he waved his flag and off I went to the very end of the race. And what? So everyone had cleared the first corner. I joined the race. I was last, but by the end of the race, I'd caught up and I'd overtaken nine bikes. Oh, yeah. so you're, you're not actually as slow as we thought you were. We'll, we'll let you start yeah. from the back of the grid. So then I was allowed to join the race. So everyone goes on the grid to form up. I would go to pit lane. Everyone would set off on their sighting lap. I will then join from the pit lane. I've got two people waiting for me at the back of the grid. But as everybody else gets themselves lined up on the grid, I make sure that I'm slow enough that everyone's ready. I come and I get caught. And then the person at the front moves out of the way and I'm just held by one person who holds the back of the motorbike, keeps me balanced. And then everybody, then the race can start. And I join the race from lights out. Uh, and yeah. by doing that, I was able to, to gradually improve, uh, and get quicker. And I became a national level of racer. And then I got my ACU race instructors, uh, level as well. So then I became a, a race instructor for able-bodied riders, but also the oh. most important is that it established a pathway for other people who were paralyzed to get into racing. And now, because for three years, I kept a totally clean sheet, didn't do anything wrong, didn't have any crashes, didn't have any instances. They then sort of allowed me to have a big capacity motorcycle and opened up more circuits. And now, if you are paralyzed in this country and you want to become a racer, you can just go to any club you want do your license with everybody else and race any bike you want so if you want to race yeah. you know two stroke you can go out there and you can go and race a two stroke but if you want to race a thousand cc 200 horsepower animal you can go and do that as well and you there is no i'm 100 percent integration within this country and yeah and i'm i suppose that is one thing that I'm really, really proud of is that Amen. has facilitated so many others to get it and not just now this country. So when I first did it, I was the first, first paraplegic, uh, com you know, complete paraplegic to race and the FIM, they were looking at what I was going to do, you know, and everyone was ready to stop what was going on, but 
like I said, I kept a clean sheet, kept my nose clean. And it facilitated other countries to allow racing to happen in, in, within their own federations. Yeah. There's some countries, wow. France, Italy, Spain, they, the disabled riders compete in a separate championship and you either race a 600 or a thousand, which is great that they have a separate championship, but my whole idea was full integration. Yeah. Yeah. There was no difference in Holland. Now, uh, we've got uh, a rider and he competes in able body, uh, Finland. There was, uh, another one, uh, America, uh, yeah. they have full integration as well. So the charity Amazing. that I set up experience, yeah. uh, had the, an American who was over in the UK, his wife was working Mike and he went back to the United States and he set up the bike experience USA along with a number of other, um, disabled motorcycle you know, avid motorcyclists, uh, who were disabled over in the USA. And so you've got the bike experience USA and you've got racing going on. And again, it's full integration. And, and to me, that's the most important thing. You know, it doesn't matter if I don't win a race because when I go out and I'm competing, I'm competing alongside everybody. I'm not being segregated. And, yeah. All the it doesn't matter if you're paralyzed. Yeah. You know, I have won a trophy. I have managed to get the third from the back of the grid. So it's not saying it's not possible, um, but you know, you have to work hard at it, but also it's, what do you want from racing? Do you want a trophy or do you want that feeling of racing alongside your, yeah. you know, your races? And for me, that's the most important thing. The battles that you have on track with another racer, that's what it's about. That's racing. Not. You know, if I was the greatest racer in the world and I set off at the star and I didn't see anybody and I just lapped really quickly and I came in and be like, well, that's just a, just going through the process, you're going through the motions. Where's the, yeah. where's the chat? The challenge for me is always getting from the back of the grid and how far forwards can I go? Right. Well, the first us in a racer. Yeah. Tr transition, transition in from what you were talking about uh, a little bit, um, you, the charity you set up, the bike experience, uh, basically, um, it, it advises and teaches the table motorcyclists, uh, how, how they can ride again. Correct. That's what the bike experience is. Uh, can yeah. you get into a little bit like when you started it and, and some, some of the things that you've, uh, been able to implement into, into this, uh, charity. Yeah. So the bike experience began in 2011. Uh, at Castle Coombe, I was wanting to share the enjoyment that I had of riding a motorcycle with other people because I knew the feeling that I had when I was out there riding a motorbike. Other people wanted that same feeling. And so we began with one bike, getting a rider to come in, showing them how to do it, going out with them. And then it sort of snowballed and more and more people wanted to come. And so I had to evolve the way the bike experience was working, needed to buy more bikes, needed to get donations of leathers because not everyone could still have their leathers. Maybe they'd had an accident and they were cut out of their leathers and, right. you know, and they only wanted to come just the once to see if they could still do it. Uh, and one of the things that I was really focused on was not putting the cost on to the rider that wanted to come. I didn't want cost to stop someone from doing something, you know, the, so example, my accident, the person that caused my accident left the scene. They were never found. I, I got no compensation. Gee. So there are other people that have had accidents that have had conversation. Yeah. They got some money. Okay. And there are people like me that haven't got a penny. To, and when I was first injured and there were loads of things that I wanted to do and people say, yeah, you can come and do this. It's really exciting, but it's going to cost you 250 pounds or it's going to cost you 500 pounds. So I was like, right. well, I, I can do that because I don't have the money. So I was adamant 
money was not going to stop people. The only thing that was going to stop them was their own choice. And so yeah. I got to donate kit. I got bikes donated and suddenly I, I got a, a team together that were, you know, bikers that wanted to help other people. And so cool. I got, got a regular crew together. And so it gradually morphed and it evolved into what we're doing now. And so we have six adapted motorcycles and they're adapted for different types of disability. So we have a motorcycle that can be used if you only have your right arm. And the same, we have a motorbike that can be used if you only have your left arm. So, so long as you have one arm that you can hold onto the handlebar right. and you can twist the brake, we will give it a go. Uh, we have geared bikes, awesome. which have, uh, an electronic gear shifting system. So you still have the clutch, and you've got buttons on the handlebars and you press the buttons and that operates a little actuator and that punches the gears up and down. Or we have these two automatic bikes, the Aprilia Mana, and those are the ones that we've converted for either right hand or left hand use only. Uh, so ooh, we have those, we have a one, two, five, uh, we've built a set of landing skids for want of a better word so they're attached to the whole suspension unit and we lock these heavy duty metal bars in place they've got sort of uh plastic pucks underneath them which slide over the surface and we lock them down at high height and no matter what weight you are when you get on the bike because it's linked to the suspension they stay one high off the ground yeah. these are for people who are very nervous who are first timers and if you stall like the bike training it, wheels. it just cool. it doesn't over but the they're yeah. not, i didn't use the wheel because i knew from my own experience of riding with the landing gear which had wheels on it once you put a wheel on something it tracks in a straight line and it changes yeah. your steering so by having a puck it simply slides over the surface. It doesn't try and track in a straight line. So that's why I went for the puck and not the wheel concept. And so, yeah, we have right. bikes. I have a regular trusted group of what I call my lodge crew. And these are people who have been working with the charity for a number of years. And I have a number of instructors and a lot of the instructors are disabled. So we have one instructor who had a stroke. Uh, he, you know, made a recovery, he's able to walk again, but at the time when he had his stroke, he wasn't sure if he was going to walk or talk ever again, but now he is, uh, you know, I helped him to get back on a motorbike and now he comes and instructs at the charity. I've got another, uh, leg amputee who instructs, I've got a paraplegic that comes and instructs. So these are people that have empathy with people sure. that are coming for their first time because it is a very daunting thing. If you are paralyzed or if you have a disability to be put on a motorcycle and yeah. set off, yeah, knowing that, know that you cannot put your feet down. And so you're right. trusting the launch crew who have hold of the motorbike to hold it upright. And that's the most important thing is being upright and balanced for the rider so that if they're balanced and upright and they set off, they, they had set off in a straight line. The bike is lent to one side. As soon as they set off, they veer to one side. So we're very mindful of working with the rider to make sure that they're centered, the bike is centered. Uh, yeah. And now we walk in a big car park. And the first thing we do is we get people on the bike and then we do a straight line launch and catch. They don't do anything. They just drive away. They ride 30 yards and they get caught by another group of people. That group of people manually turns them around and then they get sent back and they keep doing that until they're happy with the whole launching and catching procedure. And then yeah. we introduce steering input because we learned from example that just because someone has, oh, I've ridden a quad bike, I'll be fine. But a quad bike has different steering to a motorcycle. A quad bike is turn left to go left. Right. And the first time we had someone who said, oh, I can do it. I've been on a quad bike uh, uh, they uh, <laughs> in the corner and they did quad bike steering and they drove straight the head. So we learned a lot. So now yeah. do your straight line on the latch, 
then you do a steering input, and then you do figure of eight at slow speed, and then you get moved onto our track that we have coned out, which is all around the outside of the area that we have. And we lead you with an instructor, and then we follow you with an instructor, and it gets to the point that hopefully by the end of the day, you are able to be launched, you can go off, you can go ride around the cone course, and you can come back and be caught. And you're out there by yourself. Those good plates, the, the skid plates that are attached to the suspension, can those act or replace catchers as well if they use those skid plates? Or is that just functional for riding to maintain stability? Yeah, they're, they're just there in case you stall and stop and it prevents you from falling over. Okay, cool. So we don't use them. So we always use the human launch. If, if you cannot come to a stop unaided, then we will always have three people to catch you. One at the front and two at the back to come in and like a pencil right. movement. If you are a leg amputee, then you will always have two people until you are familiar. Because I've had people come before who are a leg amputee and they go out and they go riding and it takes you away. It takes you back to the time before your injury. Lions. And yeah. People have come and they've just been smiling and they've gone to put a leg out and it's yeah. no longer there because they forgot wow. that they were a Wow. Leg. That's insanely powerful. Yeah. Man. And the important. And when the rider is finally doing their little laps by themselves, I often speak with their family because I'm not always very popular with the family <laughs> to begin with. In the beginning, yeah. <laughs> one, not a motorbike, of which it may have been the cause of their accident. So then I go and chat with them and I ask them, what do they see? And they say, well, I... I just see a motorcyclist. I said, yeah, do you see, do you see a disabled motorcyclist? They're like, well, well, no, no, I just see Billy or Susie or whoever it is. They're just a motorcyclist. I said, exactly. And how do you think they are feeling inside? And yeah. they go, yeah, they'll just be feeling just like a motorcyclist. And I said, and that yeah. now is their moment, which will be a catalyst for them because they, as they are riding around, have totally forgotten that they're an amputee, that they've got MS, that they've got cerebral palsy. What an impact. There is. And right. it is truly a magical experience. And, you know, you see the difference in that one day from when they arrive, especially if it's their first time, and you can see it in their eyes that there is fear of the unknown. There is doubt in their own ability. But when they leave on that day, they could move the earth if they yeah. try. They could, they could, you know, they could change the sun's orbit by simply looking at it. That's how they feel. Just from the smile alone. Yeah. yeah. It is incredible. And you can see it. They come in and if they, when they crack the visor, you see a light burning brightly in their yeah. eyes. It, it's got to be, it's a powerful thing. Ah, oh, wonderful. The, the, that's, that aspect has to be so overwhelming to, to witness and be a part of. And you've been able to engage in public speaking around the world, um, communicating messages and advice. And I'm, I'm curious, what main messages are you trying to convey in those engagements? And also just in general, what advice would you give to people that are looking to overcome obstacles? So within my talks, I, I go over what we've talked about, you know, the, the journey, the story, PE teacher through to being paralyzed through to going to the Paralympics, the disappointment of not winning, but then being proud of what I achieved and then the racing. And using the challenges and the momentum that you build up to go from one to the other to the other. But the point that I get across at the end is that I don't have any magical ingredient. The audience has exactly what I have. I have that little person inside and you have 
that little person inside. I was lucky enough to have that 16 and a half weeks of bed rest to reflect and look inwards and discover this resilience that was inside of me, this power, this energy, because I believe that we're all born with it. And then slowly we forget that we have it. All right. And the, the narrative that we get told by others stops us believing in ourselves, especially those people that say, well, you're never going to be able to do that. You're too small. You're never going to be able to do that. You're, you're, you're a woman. You're never going to be able to do that because you know, you're a different color, you know, whatever it is, the narrative that people say, it starts to affect us and we start to Pattern. believe yep. and we, that we all have the power inside of us. And that's the most important thing that I want everybody to realize is that, you know, no one person is a superhuman people that have achieved things have simply tapped into that inner person, that little person inside and believe in themselves. And if you believe in yourself, I'm not saying you are going to go and climb Everest, but you can set goals that you think are difficult. You can work towards them. And even if you don't get there, you can be proud of yourself for at least taking that first step out towards achieving them. Yeah. yeah. You know, there are certain things that I'm never going to do, uh, and certain limitations that are on me, but I never stop trying and I never stop trying to be the best version of me as well. Uh, and that's really important because we all have our, our own best version of us and limitations don't change. define you. Yeah. And life can change so quickly that's right. and you know, what you might be able to achieve suddenly you can't like, I can't go and hike up a mountain. I can't, it's not physically possible, but there's lots of things that I can do and I can still have an incredibly fulfilling life, living it to the best of my ability. Uh, and one of the most tearful things that I've ever come across is I went to a, a school for you know, severely disabled young children. And I gave my talk and I felt a total fraud being there because I had the use of my arms. I lived independently. And most of these children were never going to experience that. Most of the children weren't going to get to the same age as me. They were all going to, you know, die early deaths because of their various different disabilities and illnesses. And I went back at the end of the academic year to celebrate their achievements. And I remember one girl who thanked me for my talk because it encouraged her to be the best person that she could be. And, and she'd learned to eat by herself. And that was her Everest. And I remember that to this day, and it can be so powerful if we believe in ourselves and she was so proud and everybody was so proud of what she'd achieved because for her, that was the hardest thing she could have ever done. Uh, and it makes me realize that, you know, we all have these limits of what is our best and that was for her was the best. And, you know, and I was so pleased for her and so proud of what she had achieved. Uh, and I never take away people's achievements because it's not as good as mine, or it's not, you can't draw direct parallels because if someone does something that is their hardest, excuse me, that, that, that's, that's all we can ask for in their life and they've given their best. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. It's it's just, that was, yeah, that was it's happy, tears, happy tears for this, this a really you're, amazing. You're, 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 yeah. you, know what, you know, what's amazing just, um, for, for Ben and I to sit here and listen to the things that you laying in bed, staring at the ceiling for such a long period of time to what you were able to accomplish by the power of thought and belief 
and the things that you have brought on to others to help others uh, from, you know, gears to riders to basically everything imaginable. And now even speaking with kids and, and, and telling people the story and be, being able to share it, uh, it it's absolutely amazing. I, I wanted to ask you this. Um, it, it seems like you never stop challenging yourself, which is absolutely amazing. That. And that's what I get from this. Like you, you always, every time you feel like you got somewhere, you take the next step to go even higher. So, um, looking ahead, uh, w w what are some of the goals, some of your goals, aspirations for the future, man? Cause you're, you're, you're like Superman. I swear to God, uh, both in terms wow. of like athletic endeavors, uh, your work advocacy with your charitable events. Well, what's, what's on the horizon with you? So I have, I have a few things that I, I need to do. Uh, one is to write an adult book, oh, not I like a, right. not well, that sort of adult book, <laughs> but a, a person's side for children. So it's a motivational book for six to 13 year olds, because so many people write inspirational books for adults, but what about the kids? Why don't, why don't we inspire children at an early age and see where they could have got to? You know, it's all very well inspiring people at the age of 50 or 60. And maybe they might be saying, oh, if only I'd known that when I was 13, I might have taken a different path in my life. So I've written that book. The plan is to try and write a proper long book that can be read by, you know, uh, uh, adults about the journey that I've been on to, to help them, uh, yeah, to, to hopefully be the catalyst that causes a change in the narrative that they tell themselves and they go on to achieve whatever they can. Um, there's your title. Um, yeah. Then because I love doing things, uh, and I obviously <laughs> love doing things the hard way. Uh, I've decided that I'm going to try and sail around great Britain, uh, yeah. but other Sailors that are paralyzed who have done it in adapted boats or adapted craft. I'm doing it in a standard 34 foot dot. Wow. Um, I'm going with a good Neil, who's a leg amputee. He lost his leg through diabetes. Uh, and so the oh. two of us have effectively one partially working leg, uh, between us. And we're going to try and sail all the way around, so we're around the outside of Ireland and over the top of Scotland, which hasn't been done before. And we'll be setting off on the 20th oh. of June. Uh, and attempt uh, now I'm not going to say we're going to succeed because it is actually right. really quite difficult. And um, are you but, documenting okay, so this? But I'm not going to shy away from it, knowing that there is a high chance I'm going to fail because I would rather fail whilst trying than never have ever tried. Amen. Absolutely. Are, are you, are you documenting this trip? Is, is that the goal you guys going to plan to try to document it to, to put a, a documentary together? Yeah, I would, I, I don't know because, okay. I would do this challenge if no one ever found out about it. Understand. So I, 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 I but I also know that if I do it, just from speaking to people in the past that they would like to know about it because it might help them. So there's sort of like this two, it's a double-edged sword. One is I would, I do things because I wish to do them, not because I wish to talk about them. But then also I've done things which when I do talk about it has impacted and helped other people. So if I don't tell them, I'm not helping them. So I will try to document it. Uh, it might just be that I write a, a, a small book or we do some, you know, uh, vlogs or whatever you call it. Uh, but I'm really, really bad at typing, which is why I haven't written my main book. Hey, so there's thinking, no excuse oh, now. Uh, you can dictate. Yeah. You can dictate. No excuse. He has to. 60 miles an hour and race because at 200 miles an hour. That you can hit the day, but not letting you off the hook on this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. <laughs> and then I suppose then the other, the other wonderful challenge that I'm looking forward to is, um, getting married. 
and hey. I have a I have a, a very wonderful fiance Julie who is yeah. an amazing in my life um and she has three incredible children who oh, I'm cool be honored uh to 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 spend time with uh and we're just wow. trying to find a time to get married uh seeing as I keep doing stupid things like <laughs> I go off the sailing around here. Here. so and it's difficult to try and sort it out because she's she's from Germany so do we get married in Germany with her family or you know she's been living in London for so long so do we get married in London or do we go to Cornwall where my family are from it's just trying to trying to find the right place um and then one of our friends chirped up that they went to the Bahamas to get married so now she's like, oh, uh, yeah. let, 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 let's, let's maybe fly to the Bahamas with the kids. But so well, you oh, um, sail, sail to the Bahamas and get good. <laughs> we could we'll, we'll take a very long time to get there, I think. But it's, uh, yeah. It, so those, those are the things that I'm looking forward to doing, um, uh, in, in the, in the, in the, in the next foreseeable future. Uh, I'm sure something else, and with the sailing, because I'm doing it in a boat that's not adapted, I want to show people that you can find ways to work around solution. Yeah, oh, oh, sorry. You can find ways to work around problem. Okay. We figured out a way of how I can get on and off a boat, even though it's not adapted for me. You know, we undo one of the guardrails and then I sort of come up next to it in, on the pontoon and I, and I sit on the side and then I lower my back, I go under the guardrail and I sit up on the other side and then I sort of slide onto the boat. And it, it turns out to be pretty easy for me to get on the boat. Okay. I'm still on my backside and people are sliding me about, but right. very quickly I'm sat in the cockpit of a yacht and I can go off and I can go sailing. And I really love thinking about our mind and how you can process events in order to help yourself deal with the change that is always happening to us. And I find being on the water really, really helps it because there's this noise of the water going past you. There is a slight movement of the boat. And it is a really tranquil place. It can be quite a noisy place if you're racing and there's lots of wind and bah, you know, sure. but it can also be times where it can be really peaceful and with all sorts of different issues, problems, disabilities can find peace on the water. You can also find peace obviously on a motorbike and some people can use that. Uh, some people can find it in the mountains and I find it in the mountains. You know, I just going up on a lift, looking at the snow, seeing the snow, when the sun shines off of it, it just looks like they, it, the, the entire place is carpeted in diamonds and they're shining and they're sparkling and it looks alive. And I find beauty in that. So there are different places that people can find beauty, people can find peace, and then people can start that inward reflection. And so if I can help people with a boat and getting them on board and taking them out and giving them an experience again, which becomes the catalyst for them to self-reflect, you know, that's another good thing. So that actually know, I, goes, uh, that goes I'm perfectly sure into the. The next question, big, strong advocate. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's a little bit of a delay. You go, you go. Sorry. I'm... Uh, so speaking of how you like to kind of think about what goes on in your mind, um, and the self-reflecting, it, it, it goes perfectly into this next kind of idea and question that I have. We had an interview with an incredible woman, Vanessa Ruck, and she went through a traumatic accident as well. And we talked a little bit about identity. And part of what's so traumatic is that we tend to identify with 
what we do. Uh, she was into all kinds of adventure sports and she had wrapped her identity up into that. And then once realizing she wouldn't be able to do any of those things anymore, it hit her really hard and it kind of puts you into this tailspin of, well, who am I now? You know, what is life to me? And after the accident, it's, it's that self-reflection. It, it forces you into self-reflection, just like it did with you and moving forward in life, you find that identity means something different to you. And I, I, I'm curious what now, what aspects and, and character traits do you think do you find yourself identifying with currently? What contributes to Talon's identity? Yeah, identity is, it is difficult when you experience change and you change the identity and trying to adjust your mind to something new. And it's, it's not just for people that have a, an injury. There are people that change jobs, people that move a house from a different direction or different, different through loss, uh, you know, or, you know, and I, I work with athletes So it's when athletes come to the end of their career and they were always known as the, you know, the long jump right. or the football right. and suddenly taken away from them. Um, and it, it's, it's difficult. The identity, you, you have to sit down and think about it. It's not something that's easy. And, and I go through a, a process every three to six months of, of, uh, of, of values and identity. And I will every three to six months, write down a list of values, which I hold dear at that time. What are the most important values to me at the moment? And then I will whittle that down into three values. And then I will, uh, I've actually written them down because if you write stuff down, it slows down your thinking process. It's all very well to think about things, but you can flip very quickly from one to the other. So you force yourself to write stuff down and I write down the values I look at the word and then I finally choose three and then I write down, how do I change those values into my behavior? And that then helps me with my identity and it's a constant shifting thing you're not going to be you're not the same person now as you were when you were 10 when you were 20 when you were 30 you're always shifting your values are always shifting and things realign and so your identity is constantly in a state of flux and constantly moving so by going through that process i can always identify what is important at this stage of my life, uh, the, you know, there are some values which seem to come up time and time again, that always make it into my top 10. And, you know, there's some that often reappear in my top three, uh, and, and, and that one is, is sort of, it's an, it's, it's, it, the meaning sort of remains the same. The actual descriptive word often changes, but often it's like being honorable to your word. So, or, or honor. So you are, you always do what you say you're going to do. If you're doing something honorable, you're thinking about the outcome of that action. And is that a positive thing? Is it going to contribute to someone's happiness or is it going to be a negative thing? In which case, you know, don't do it, you know, uh, and being authentic is another one that often comes up, you know, if you are yourself, yeah. that's the best person you can be. Don't try and be anybody else other than you because people forget that they're awesome. Everyone is actually pretty amazing. 
And if you just allow yourself to be you, the real you, um, though those are the that that's who people really want to see. And sometimes people put layers and layers and layers over themselves and hide away their originality. And then once you do that, you struggle with your identity because you don't actually know who you are. Um, you know, always asking yourself, like I say, I always ask myself the question, what have I done today? This made me a better person. You know, that puts the, uh, the, like the, the duty on me, I take responsibility for what I am doing and I'm not going to shift the blame onto somebody else. Accountability. You know, yeah. My, my actions are my actions. You know, I, I'm not going to try and blame it on something else that has happened or, uh, you know, a, a an event that has maybe influenced me to be like this. It's like, do you know what? You are you. Own it. Can, can I ask you a question um, for, for uh, people listening? Uh, before we get into the speed round questions and have some uh, laughs, uh, I wanted to just, um, keep, for people to follow you, uh, to, to get linked up with you and, and, and follow your journey, uh, where are you on social media and all those places? Like, well, we can, we're going to link all, all this stuff to the notes of this podcast, but can you tell the audience uh, where, where you can be found? Yeah, well, luckily, being called Talent Skills Figures means I can be found very easily <laughs> on the internet. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram. Uh, I have a website. Well, I have a couple of websites. So obviously, we've got the Bike Experience website. We have my work website, which is the speaking one, which is Paralympian Speaker. And then I have the the new sailing challenge, which is called Sail Beyond. So those are uh, some of the websites that people can look at. There, there are various videos on YouTube. So there's a really nice one called The Little Person Inside, which is on YouTube. It's 11 minutes long, and it was done in 2014. Uh, it's a short film. It's one of a number of uh, laurels at various uh, film uh, awards showings, whatever you call it, film festivals, film festivals, that's one. Uh, and it is a very short introduction to me and getting on the motorbike and riding it. Uh, and it's, it's a nice video, even if you don't actually like motorbikes. Um, and there's some of my talks have been put up on the internet. So if people wanted to, to revisit something that I've said is you know, just go on YouTube, type in talent skills piggins and you'll pretty well much find um, videos of me crashing while skiing uh, and mm -hmm. uh, crashing whilst riding race bikes and right. crashing whilst driving race cars or crashing <laughs> whilst like, um, so yeah, I'm making it crashing. It's one of my <laughs> mainstream. Uh, and that's why I suppose, you know, I've, I have stopped the competitive side of racing with bikes. Um, even I know that there's a time when you've just got to say, that's, that's, that's enough. Right. Uh, the last right. accident right. I had, I lost my finger. Um, oh man. At the same time as I, I lost my finger, I shattered this bone. So this hand had to, this one had to be wired back and was in a cast. So I had wires sticking out of my thumb. Mm. And so that was in a cast for a number of months. And then I had to have my finger amputated and I couldn't use that. I'm a wheelchair user. How do yeah. you get about if I can't hands? So yeah, that was a really good time for me. I realized that maybe now that I'm in my fifties, hmm. I can just instruction. I'm very happy doing race instruction. I'm very happy doing track days and I'm very happy doing the bike experience, uh, and teaching people. Really? I don't need to, to race motorbikes anymore. And, and also I have the, the sailing challenge to, to be focusing on because it all costs lots of money and I don't have any money. So, yeah. yeah. All right. I've always, so, so for you, you ready for the speed round? We have gone in. Ben, what's it, what's the prize you call it, man? What, what happens oh. if he doesn't hit the two minutes? Don't hit the two minutes. You have six months to get your book out there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> 
So start, start thinking. All right, let's do it. What is the best motorcycle you've ever owned or ridden? A uh, GSX-R 750K7. Beautiful okay. handling mode bike. Yeah. Yep. If your motorcycle could talk, what would yours say about you? Be a little bit easier on the gear shifts. <laughs> you didn't say, oh, it's a bastard. It's bloody with it. It's just really brutal on the gearbox. <laughs> All right. Best place you ever rode and why? <sighs> Oh, that's easy. Mugello. Such a beautiful, beautiful setting for a racetrack. The changes in elevation, the different types of turns, the different types of speed. It's the greatest racetrack in the world. Beautiful, beautiful setting. Oh, go back there. If that was the only one time I could ride ever again, I'd be on that place. Okay, awesome. Um, favorite ice cream flavor? Vanilla. If you could time travel, which era would you visit and why? Oh, I'd want to go back to where the dinosaurs are around because I'm just amazed and fascinated by dinosaurs. I can't believe that they're so big and they existed. It's incredible. Okay. Uh, favorite motorcycle movie of all time? Um, it's, it's The Great Escape because it's sort of in it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, does that count? Yeah, of course, of course. Deep. That's, a, that's, a, that's a classic. Hey. You know. a classic, absolutely. Uh, who was your movie crush when you were a teenager? Um, oh, who was the woman that was in Weird Science? Oh, uh, Kelly LeBrock. Wes. Yeah. Uh, oh, my dude. God. Me too. Dude, it was unbelievable. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome that you remembered that, man. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, she was she was smoking hot, man. That movie was funny as heck. All right. Uh, if you could meet and have dinner with one person, past or present, who would it be? Uh, I'd want to go and have dinner with Robbie Nash. He's a miracle windsurfer. He is my he is one person I look up to. I respect. He's in his fifties. He's still windsurfing. He's still out there doing it with all the younger generation. He won the world championships when he was thirteen. What legend? I I wanted to become a professional windsurfer, and I wanted to go to Hawaii, and I wanted to learn from him. I never did. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, one law you would change if you were president for the motorcycle community? Full integration of able-bodied and disabled in all countries. Racing. Okay. Best piece of advice you ever received? Okay, I received a piece of advice from Christopher Reeve, as in Superman. So he yeah. found out that I was paralyzed. And he told me to remember that I was still me. Wow. That's awesome. Huh? He didn't sign it, which was a bit off. I'm joking. He can. <laughs> What's that? You know, he, he is another inspiration as well, Chris. Yeah, for sure. For sure. If you could, if you could get on stage and sing or jam with one band, who would it be? It'd got to be Queen. All right. That would be immense. Inside Freddie Merck. Amazing. Oh my gosh, he was just an incredible showman. That would have been amazing if I could sing. I would have loved to have done that. No doubt about that. That's a good one, too. Um, what is one piece of clothing you own that you love but your spouse hates? Um, my, probably my rabbit hat. I've got a rabbit <laughs> okay. but... Sorry. It looks a bit weird, but I, it's so warm. You know, it keeps my head warm. That's right. Who's your all-time favorite cartoon character? Uh, Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry. All right, Jerry. All right, that's good. There you go, Jerry. What's the silliest superstition you follow before or after a ride? What? I always have... Well, I always put my left glove on first. Okay. And the other thing I do is... I know it's not silly, but I always look up at the sky... And I always ask my brother to ride side saddle with me. Or ride pillion. I, I, I always ask my brother to ride pillion with me. Which isn't silly, but it is something that I will always do every single time I get on the motorbike. That's perfect. That's well, perfect. I forgot once. Look what happened. Really? Oh, wow. No, that no, was the only so time I, That's the only time, the one time I forgot to ask my brother to ride pillion with me. And I came off. Oh, that's what I figured. Wow. Okay. Well, last question. Beside the One Gang Worldwide podcast, of course, 
What is your other favorite podcast? I like listening to uh, The Fall of Civilizations. So I, I, I really like history and I, and I find learning from the past really fascinating. And, you know, hopefully we can learn not to repeat the same mistakes. But unfortunately, I'm not in charge of the planet, so people are making the same mistakes. Well, no, I'm sure. Good on our end of the pond. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I, I think one thing that we learned today is that, um, one, getting to know you, you're an amazing person, not just of the things that you've gone through, but my personal opinion is what's amazing about you is your mindset, and how you've always taken everything that you've gone through and given back so uh, to others to help them along the journey. So uh, just we had a total blast getting a chance to know you. And thank you so much Bye -bye. for coming on the show. I guess going to have a disclaimer on that. Is it, it has taken me 21 years to get to who I am. And, and I know that I'm not the finished article, so I'm going to keep on going because sometimes... I suppose when you give a talk or whenever I give a presentation or you hear a podcast, you just see a very short snapshot of my mm. entire life and you think, wow, you're amazing. Do you, but do you know what? It took me, it's, it's really a long slog and, but it is achievable by other people. It just takes time, you know, whether or not it's taking 13 years to accept being paralyzed, you know, or. You know, taking, well, I'm still in the process of accepting my brother's death, you know, and that's 16 years, you know, it's, it's, it, there are very big time scales involved, but you can, yeah. And it was great to chat with both of you and I've really enjoyed it. You as well, Alan. I ordered the book for our kids. We're looking forward to it. And I'm going to be waiting not so patiently for the adult version without the nudity. <laughs> thank you talent you guys you have an awesome day we really really Thank appreciate you so your time but my pleasure thank you